really, I, I, I'm always uh, supporting any kind of conference where we have to talk about this crucial issue of women in Islam and our within, our, within our societies and within our communities. And I will come to the, to the topic straight away. But I cannot start today without mentioning that, of course, they were expecting so many people here, and, and many are not here because they may be involved in the demonstration uh, for Palestine. So I want to start with this, uh, in the name of justice, as it was mentioned, but also in the name of dignity. And there are principles that are undisputable when it comes to human dignity. So whatever is your take in any political dimension, here we are, and uh, supporting, and we must, I think, Muslims and non-Muslims, in the name of human dignity, in the name of justice, to support uh, the Palestinians in Gaza, in the West Bank, and everywhere. So my heart is there, even though my body is with you, uh, and my mind is with you, bringing you towards that, them. To say, yes, I agree, and I said it many times, to kill innocent people is wrong. But you cannot just take a stand today by putting Palestinians and Israeli government today at the same level. The principle is clear. They are oppressors and they are oppressed. The state of Israel is the oppressor and Palestinians are the oppressed. So the resistance is legitimate and we have to resist in our way. We are not supporting violence, but if we are silent, we are promoting the violence. So let us speak out, say the truth, say that we are supporting the Palestinians, that we are supporting human dignity, and we are not supporting them because they are Muslims. By the way, they are not only Muslims. We are supporting them because they are oppressed and they are human beings. We are supporting and protecting human dignity. So I want to start with this, telling you as well that we launch a global movement of nonviolent resistance against the extremist and violent policy of the State of Israel. And go on internet, on my website, on others, you will have this appeal with seven principles that are indisputable. And they are crossing the border, not only Islamic, they are universal. And do you, your job, speak out, do something. And even if you speak about women, it's also the time to speak about this because there is no difference. Women there are resisting, they are killed. It's a human uh, struggle. And I think that we have to say something. We don't only have to say something out of emotion, it's an ongoing struggle. So it's today, it's tomorrow. And after the ceasefire, we have to continue in the name of justice because it's a local crisis but has global impact. So it's our duty. So really, Muslims and non-Muslims, this is what we have to do. And I'm very happy to see some of the Jewish British citizens who are much more courageous than some of our Muslim brothers and sisters. It's just a shame not to be able to say something because we are scared. Sarah Yosef was speaking about confidence. This is the starting point. If you are for justice, you are confident. If you are for money, you may be scared. Okay, let me start with the topic. And as I took the, the minutes you gave me to say something about this, so I will stick and try to stick to the 45 minutes that you gave me. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the question of women, when it comes to this, let me start with an introduction and to highlight three main points. The first point is really to say something about, when it comes to speak about women, of course, at his, uh, as it was said, and I think it's important to speak about history, to speak about uh, the evolution, the historical evolution, understanding from the first scholars, uh, what happened, in which way the women were involved, and in which way we lost this memory 
and we lost even the stance that some women had in the Islamic history. At the same point, we have to be very cautious not to idealize the past, to uh, think about something which was so great in the past, and not to understand that it's an ongoing struggle, it's not easy, and some points were uh, to be made by, by women throughout the Islamic history as well. But when we speak about the question of women, we have to focus on three main fields. The first one is, before even speaking about rights and duties, and this is the problem that we have, the struggle for uh, 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 justice and, and evolution and reform from an Islamic viewpoint is not only about my rights and my duties, it's deeper than that. It's about the status first. It's a field, and I will come to this. The second is uh, speaking about liberation, and I will speak about the concept of liberation is, is central. And, and I, allocate, I allocated in the, the new book one chapter out of this whole process of speaking about Islamic ethics and applied Islamic ethics on women. And the subtitle is Islamic ethics and liberation. And liberation is very much connected to anything which has to do with human beings, but also women, and I also want to come to this. And the third word, which is essential, is empowerment. As you had it in your uh, presentation, your introduction to the day, to this seminar, I think that three main words, status, liberation, and empowerment, in which we have to deal with this, this is something which is quite important. With these three different fields, what is needed now is not only to speak about the fields and to come with, okay, this is what we have to do, the, uh, we should do this, we should do that. Before, upstream from the whole discussion, it's important also to have a vision. What do we want to achieve? And this is why the status is very important. When you speak about the status of women, you understand that there is an achievement there. There are objectives that we want to reach. So through the objectives, we get the vision, and objectives and vision will help us to uh, decide the steps that we have to follow, because there are steps. We cannot get everything uh, in one go. We have to think about this vision, the objective that we want to achieve, and what are the steps that we have to follow. So it's a strategy. It's a struggle. It's a strategy. It's based on something which is important, and this is the third point that I want to, to make here. What do we want to achieve? Why am I here? Why am I coming to one conference speaking about women in Islam? Is it only to speak about empowerment, liberation, and the status of women? What is the deep achievement? What do I want to achieve, really? It's in fact for a believer coming from within an Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic references and from uh, a universe of reference. The, the main point, which has to be very clear, what I want to achieve is faithfulness. I want to be faithful. Faithful to a message that I understand it's a universal message. It's for all the people. It's not only for us. It's a message where you find principles that are universal. It doesn't mean that we want all the people to be Muslims. But our Islamic principles should be understood by all the people. This is the universality of our message. The universality of our message is the, the fact that our principles are ours. It doesn't mean that we are the only one to be able to understand them. So the point here is we want to remain faithful to the Islamic message as Muslims. And at the same time, to be understood by the people around us because, in fact, this is the mercy of diversity, which is you understand who I am, even though you are not like or such or like me, or, or you are not sharing with me my principles. This is you are but a mercy for the world. If you are a mercy for the world, it's not for all the people to be like you. No, the mercy is not. I'm a mercy the very moment you become like me. No. I'm a mercy because you are who you are and who I am. But from where I am, you can understand what I stand for. And I can understand who you are. So my message is open to you, and it's not asking you to become like me. Because at the end of the day, it's not in my head. It's in your heart. It's the relationship you have with God. It's not me. I don't have, I have no power on your heart. But I can be a witness of your mind. For your mind, I am a witness. And the witness is just 
let us try to be faithful to our message. This is a very important point here. Because the problem I have with some of the, uh, the Muslims who sometimes are presented as uh, moderate Muslims, exactly the same problem that I can have with some Muslims are saying, I am representing the true Islam. In fact, that they are not mainly concerned with being faithful. They are adapting their stand to who is listening to them. Or they can be for the others, with the others, say, I'm a moderate Muslim, that the point is, look how open I am. Once again, it's a lack of confidence. And the lack of confidence is exactly the opposite. People saying, I'm not like you, Islam is not the rest, so I'm defining myself against. Which, once again, is a lack of confidence. So, to reduce Islam to something which is, Islam is not, is a lack of confidence. Or, uh, Islam is so open that Islam is nothing. Special. So, open to everything with no rules, no limits, no principles, moderation, delusion, nothing. So here, faithfulness is a very important point. And the problem that I have today, when it comes to the issue of Muslim women, is that the Muslims and our communities, in the name of Islam, are indulging into discriminations, superficial understandings, betrayal, and not faithfulness of the Islamic message. So this is why I think that we have to go through a radical reform, not of Islam. Islam has not to be reformed. Our interpretation has to. So many people who are not reading what I'm trying to say, just they heard someone saying that I said something I never even thought about, are saying, oh, he wants to reform Islam. No, I want to reform the Muslim understanding of Islam, their interpretations. The Quran is the Quran is not going to change. The prophetic traditions are the prophetic traditions that are not going to change. But we are changing, our minds are changing, we have to reinterpret the text according to that context. Why? Because if history is evolving, is, if geography is based on diversity, so there is no way to remain faithful but to evolve. No faithfulness without evolution. In our understanding, but in the text. Because the same text read in a new environment, you need to have a, a, a better understanding, a new understanding of the text, to be faithful to the meaning of the text in the new environment. So this is something which is also an essential point. And it means that, and especially in that field, no faithfulness without marrying two dimensions. Deep faith, because we try to be faithful, and critical mind. Critical mind being trying to understand the text in the light of the context, in the light of the environment, in the light of my society, to remain faithful to the principle. And if I'm a practicing Muslim, and I want to be faithful to the text because this is, at the end, what I want to achieve. This deep faith is to read the text in the light of these spiritual teachings that are coming with the text. And sometimes some of our fellow citizens in the West, they don't understand that. It's as if they want us to evolve, but they, 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 they forget that we are believing, that we believe that the text, the scriptural source, the Quran, the prophetic traditions are texts that we are respecting, that we think that this is coming from God.